Well, good morning. Welcome. We are delighted that you are here live and those of you who are joining us online. And today we welcome a lot of guests for our seminary for a day as well. And actually wanted to let you know we have another seminary for a day coming up in January, January 13th, which is going to coincide with our annual conference as well. And our annual conference this year is titled From Faith to Faith, The Power of God for the Christian Life. And it will feature President Kim and Dr. Doctors Horton, Troxell, and Bittner, as well as President Emeritus, Dr. W. Robert Godfrey, will be speaking at that conference as well. And we'd love for you all to be able to join us. There's information about that on our website. And if you are interested in coming to a seminary for a day as well, we also have a travel grant of up to $400 to help defray the costs of that because we don't want that to be prohibitive for you to come and sit in on some classes and meet our faculty and our students and participate in our community. We'd love to welcome you here. Again, there's more information about that online. But today we have the opportunity as well to have a Reformation Day lecture titled Why the Reformation Matters for Ministry. Afterwards, donuts and cider, but first, uh, Dr. R. Scott Clark is a professor of church history and historical theology. He's been teaching here since 1997, so before some of you were born. Uh, he received his MDiv uh, from Westminster Seminary, California, his DPhil from, DPhil from Oxford University. He's a minister in the United Reformed Churches in North America, an author, a podcaster, a friend, He's a husband and has two daughters. And brother, we're so thankful for you. Thank you for coming this morning. I almost took your notes. Well, at least he didn't tell you I was born during the Reformation, so that was, <laughs> that was good. Yeah, I wasn't, I promise. It just seems like that. Well, let's pray for a minute. Father, we are grateful to be together this morning and grateful for... Uh, uh, what it means to us to uh, reflect on the Reformation and all the benefits that we derive from it. So, Lord, hear our prayer, make our time useful and edifying, that your name may be glorified and the church may be uh, built up. Uh, Lord, we always come to you with great thankfulness that we have uh, free access, and so we come now this morning in the name of Jesus, our only High Priest. Amen. So why does the Reformation matter for ministry? Well, for most American Christians, especially for those who identify as evangelicals, self-identify as evangelicals, it doesn't really. And we don't have to speculate about that. In the 2022 State of Theology survey, when asked whether they agree or disagree with the statement, quoting, God counts a person as righteous, not because of one's works, but only because of one's faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, of 311 uh, U.S. adult respondents, 33% either disagreed strongly or disagreed. 10% didn't know, so for 43% of those surveyed, the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone was either wrong or indifferent. And 30 uh, whatever the rest of them are, 33, uh, 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 and 23 percent somewhat uh, agreed, and 34 uh, percent agree, strongly agreed. So the way the study results are presented suggests that uh, American evangelicals uh, reflect or mirror the broader um, culture on on this. If you've ever heard Shane Rosenthal do one of his famous "Man on the Street" interviews then you won't be surprised to find that most people are clueless about how we are right with God. And when I say most people, I mean people who profess to believe in Jesus and to believe the Bible. The uh, amazing thing is that this question was at the heart of the Protestant Reformation. According to J.H. Alstead, not Luther, quoting, probably paraphrasing Luther, Luther said things like this, but I think the Reform should get credit for this, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little pointed about this. This is J.H. Alstead. You've never heard of him. You've never read him. And this is maybe the only thing for which he's really famous. But it was J.H. Alstead who said that the doctrine of justification is the article of the standing or falling of the church. And he said that in 1618. That was a Reformed guy who said that. I think that's very important that we, that we know that. Because every other person that you ever hear quote that will attribute it to Luther. Everyone. 
almost without fail. But it, and to be sure, Luther did say things very much like that. And to be sure, he's probably paraphrasing Luther. But that formulation comes from a Reformed guy. That's going to be important. We're going to come back to that. Calvin called the doctrine of justification the axis of the Christian faith, of the Christian religion. What's the axis? Well, I was bad in geometry. And the only reason I passed it was they said either pass geometry or you can't play basketball anymore. Well, I better show up then and come in after class and, and we did finally, I did finally pass it. But even I know that the axis, if you stick a pole in the ground, right, and you tie a rope to it and you go around it, that, that pole in the ground is an axis and everything revolves around it. And so it's right at the center of the Christian faith. How could it be that only 34% 34 of those surveyed were able to affirm strongly such a vital doctrine? It's because the Reformation is at best a distant memory for most American Christians who have no consciousness of the Reformation uh, and it, because it's not any part of their tradition or their identity. How is it that leading evangelical theologians could publicly say that it's essential that you uh, obey as part of the instrument or ground of your justification and that anybody who says otherwise is an antinomian. That is a widely held position. This is a widely held position. It's because if you are in the dispensational world, you're basically part of the holiness tradition. You're not part of the Reformation. It doesn't live in your bones. It's not how you think. It's not how you read the scriptures. It's not who you are. You might visit and look at that strange village, but you don't live there. The truth is that this is, as I said in, in 2010, this is Sister Amy's country and we're just living in it. It's, it's really now better to say this is Victoria Osteen's country and we're just living in it. She's the real brains behind that operation, you know. What is, uh, so that, that shouldn't really surprise us in, in a way. It's sad, but it shouldn't surprise us. What is odd is how inconsequential the Reformation is for much of modern Reformed Christianity. And uh, here we are celebrating Reformation Day, and there'll be Reformation Day celebrations here on campus and in uh, Presbyterian and Reformed churches all over North America this weekend. And yet I think it's a fair question to ask whether the Reformation still matters for our theology, piety, and practice. And I, I think it does, and it should, but we have to face some things and I, I think it does for, in three ways. One, the, the Reformation uh, saved preaching. Two, the Reformation saved the authority of the word. And three, uh, the Reformation saved the gospel, which is a funny sounding thing to say, but it's true. The Reformation saved preaching, it saved the authority of the word, and it saved the gospel. And that's why, for those three reasons, if not for uh, a dozen others, it, it still matters. Uh, in one sense, the Reformation saved the very act of preaching. If I had a whiteboard here, I'd turn around and I would draw for you the basic uh, structure of a medieval church. Were you to look at a map of an early medieval or of a medieval church, what would you see? You'd see a building that was cruciform, right? There'd be a crossbar, and then right at the right at the center, the transept uh, is an altar. And what is supposed to have taken place? On that altar, at least from the 13th century and following, officially and probably, uh, not, you know, not until, by the way, not until after the, the 8th, 9th century, not until after the 9th century were people actually talking this way. But officially, from the 13th century, late 13th century forward, the medieval church said that what takes place at that altar, well, is what always takes place in an altar, a sacrifice, a shedding of blood, figuratively in this sense, and a turning away of wrath. That was the central liturgical act in the high medieval church, was a sacrifice, ostensibly, allegedly, and a turning away of wrath. Where's the pulpit in that church, that cruciform church? It's off to the side. Go to, go to St. Pierre in Geneva and look for Calvin's pulpit. It's not in the center, and it's not even Calvin's pulpit anymore, but anyway, but it's still where it was. It's off to the side. 
And that's, uh, that location is very symbolic of the status of preaching in the late medieval church and throughout most of the medieval church. It's also the case, however, that the Reformation saved the content of preaching. And how did it do that? It did that by distinguishing between law and gospel. It recovered the biblical distinction between law and gospel. It's one of the fundamental breakthroughs of the Reformation. And yet, this basic distinction is regularly characterized by Reformed writers as distinctively Lutheran. One Reformed scholar argued that Luther had a law-gospel distinction, but Calvin had a spirit-letter distinction. And that juxtaposition would be a great surprise to Calvin, who in his commentary on 2 Corinthians 3 said, by spirit letter, all I mean is law and gospel. One of the great hermeneutical breakthroughs that I try to share with my students is, keep reading. <laughs> Another writer, Reformed identifying writer, argues that the law-gospel distinction is not the same as the distinction between the covenants and works, uh, the covenants of works, and grace. Zacharias or Sinus disagreed, since he explicitly correlated those things in his 1561 Summa Theologiae. But that's supposed to be distinctively reformed theology, denying that correlation. Another Reformed writer, a prophet, another institution, writes, and I quote, Calvin and Luther shared much in common in the Protestant movement, but their respective hermeneutical and theological differences must not be discarded. To do so is to confuse Reformed theology and Lutheranism and to read into Calvin a Lutheran concept of justification by faith. And Calvin says, Monsieur, my concept of justification is purely Lutheran. I'm sorry, I have a terrible French accent. <laughs> Calvin, oh, Calvin said, I am a Lutheran. I don't know how, how much clearer he can be. I am a Lutheran, he said. He signed the Augsburg Confession. What more do you have to do to say I agree with the Lutherans? Unless you know a priori that they must have distinct conceptions. And then you, you, as we would think back home in Nebraska, you get up on your big John Deere tractor, you fire that bad boy up, and you just drive it through the text. <laughs> Prior to the Reformation, the, uh, the Bible, the scriptures, the word had become defined completely in legal terms. And this happened very, very early on in the history of the church. The whole of scripture was said to be law. And we did this against the Gnostics. And later we did this against the Albigensians. And we said all of scripture is old law and new law. It's all law. And we did that for particular reasons, mostly apologetic reasons. So that we lost the sense, although Augustine in De Spiritu et Litera uh, he articulates a distinction that if we just paid attention and said, oh, there's something here, but we, we missed it. We mostly ignored it. It's in there. Actually, I, when I read Luther saying he was excited to see that Augustine agreed with him, I always thought that was self-serving until I went back and, and read and reread De Spiritu. And then I thought, you know, Luther had a point. It really is in there. But, we, but mostly that lay dormant. Um, until about 1518, 1519, it's hard to say exactly when, but Luther came to see, in fact, that there are two kinds of words in Scripture. We can talk about the Old Testament as law in a broad sense, in a historical sense, but not in a theological sense. We can talk about the New Testament as gospel in a historical sense, but not in a theological sense. And we see that even in the Westminster Standards, in that traditional way of speaking. But the theological distinction between law and gospel becomes of the essence of the Reformation. If all of Scripture is law, that puts you on one, one footing. But if there are two kinds of words in Scripture, that puts you on a completely different footing. So that the law says, do this and live, and the gospel says, for God so loved the world. Those are two different kinds of words. Those are two different kinds of words. And our Reformed forebears were very clear about this. Calvin uh, distinguishes between law and gospel, law and faith, 
works in grace again and again and again. I was going to quote him, but there are so many, and some of them are so long, it would take most of the time to explain what he's doing. But he's very explicit about it. Theodore Beza, uh, as is sometimes happens, boils him down very nicely. And he, and he wrote this in 1558. Now listen to this. This is that great Lutheran theologian, Theodore de Bez, who succeeded Calvin and who was one of the major figures in the Reformed tradition in the, uh, through a lot of the 16th century, even into the early 17th century. We, the Reformed, divide this word into two principal parts or kinds. The one is called the law, the other the gospel. For all the rest can be gathered under one head or other of these two headings. And he goes on to say, Ignorance of this distinction between law and gospel is one of the principal sources of abuses which corrupted and still corrupt Christianity. That's Theodore Beza. His student and the Heidelberg theologian, Caspar Olivianus, my old friend, in his commentary on Romans wrote, For this reason, the distinction between law and gospel is retained. The law does not promise freely, but under the condition that you keep it completely. And if someone should transgress it once, the law or legal covenant does not have the promise or remission of sins. On the other hand, the gospel promises freely the remission of sins and life, not if we keep the law, but for the sake of the Son of God through faith. That's from his commentary on Romans. He said, in fact, in his commentary on Romans, the whole book is about the distinction between law and gospel. Who knew how thoroughly the Lutherans had infiltrated the Reformed Church in the 16th century. The whole lot of them, crypto-Lutherans. And I continue. Zacharias Ursinus, principal author of the Heidelberg Catechism, personally responsible for about 70% of the Heidelberg Catechism. And then he wrote the commentary, right? Gave the authorized lectures on the Catechism, just in case we weren't sure what it actually said. In his uh, large commentary, his Summa Theologiae that he wrote for his students, question 36, he asked, what distinguishes law and gospel? The law contains a covenant of nature begun by God with men in creation that is a natural sign to men, and it requires of us perfect obedience toward God. It promises eternal life to those keeping it and threatens eternal punishment to those not keeping it. In fact, the gospel contains a covenant of, of grace, that is one not known at all under nature. This covenant declares to us a fulfillment of its righteousness in Christ, which in the law, or which the law requires, and our restoration through Christ's Spirit. To those who believe in him, it freely promises eternal life for Christ's sake. Even William Perkins apparently was seduced by the Lutherans because in uh, in um, 1592, in, uh, in his book on preaching, no, what does the Reformation have to do with ministry? Well, this is what William Perkins, the father of the, I don't like this word much, Puritan movement, I'd rather say the, the English Reformed movement, right? without whom the Westminster Assembly would, be, would have been completely different, says, the basic principle and application is to know whether, the, he's talking to preachers here, the basic principle and application is to know whether the passage is a statement of the law or of the gospel. For when the word is preached, the law and the gospel operate differently. The law exposes the disease of sin, and as a side effect, it stimulates and stirs it up. You almost think he might have read Romans 7. But it provides no remedy for it. However, the gospel not only teaches us what is to be done, it also has the power of the Holy Spirit joined to it. He goes on to say, a statement of the law indicates the need for a perfect inherent righteousness of eternal life given through the works of the law, of, uh, of the sins which are contrary to the law, and of the curse that is due them. By contrast, he goes on to say, a statement of the gospel speaks of Christ and his benefits and of faith being fruitful in good works. In other words, according to Perkins, if you don't distinguish between law and gospel, you are not ready to preach. And the distinction between law and gospel revolutionized preaching in the 16th and 17th centuries. And I know, and I'll come back to this, I know from personal experience how essential it is to make that distinction. And, and 
what happens to your preaching when you don't make that distinction? I'll come back to that. Secondly, the Reformation saved the authority of the word. The ministry is, after all, the ministry of something. It's the service of something. It's the service of the word. Yet in its, in its zeal to defend the faith against heretics, the church has sometimes marginalized the authority of Scripture in favor of some other. For example, Basil of Caesarea in the late 4th century uh, argued, and I won't read the whole thing because it turned, it's a really long quote, but he, uh, he says uh, that uh, we received certain things delivered to us, he says, in a mystery by the tradition of the apostles. And he goes on to say that uh, on, on the basis of this tradition, unwritten tradition of the apostles, right, he defended uh, as basic and un obviously sound and unquestionable the practice, practices such as the making of the, the sign of the cross, you know, uh, turning to the east at prayer, uh, the prayer of invocation in the supper, the blessing of the baptismal water, the use of of uh, anointing oil and baptism, a threefold baptism, the renunciation of Satan and angels at baptism. He freely admitted that neither uh, any apostle or the gospel has recorded these things, but they are of great importance to the validity of the ministry, and we derive them from unwritten teaching. And that uh, appeal to unwritten uh, teaching, the unwritten apostolic authority, or, uh, unwritten apostolic tradition, uh, only increased as we faced the Albigensians and others through the medieval church. So that one of the great breakthroughs of the Reformation was to recover the apostolic and early post-apostolic conviction that as important as the church is, it's not the final authority for the Christian faith and the Christian life. About a month before his appearance at the Diet of Worms, Luther declared, where Luther would declare that his conscience was bound by the word of God, he was already in March of 21, 1521, in case you weren't sure. Uh, he was articulating that very thing in his defense of the 95 Theses. And we in the Reformed churches speak uh, with great conviction uh, about um, this truth, right, of sola scriptura. For example, in Belgian Confession, Article 3, we confess that this word of God was not sent or delivered by the will of men, but that holy men of God spoke, being moved by the Holy Spirit, as Peter says. Afterwards, our God, because of the special care he has for us and our salvation, commanded his servants, the prophets and apostles, to commit this revealed word to writing. Uh, we say in Article 5, we receive all these books and only these as holy and canonical for the regulating, founding, and establishing of our faith. In Article 7, we say that we believe that this Holy Scripture contains the will of God completely, and that everything one must, be, uh, must believe to be saved is sufficiently taught in it. For since the entire manner of worship which God requires of us is described in it at great length, no one, not even an apostle or an angel from heaven, as Paul says, ought to teach other than what the Holy Scriptures have already taught us. For since it is forbidden to add or subtract from the word of God, this plainly demonstrates that the teaching is perfect and complete in all respects. And we go on. It may be that in our time we face some threat of privileging church tradition over scripture. And we see that in our churches sometimes when people say, well, it's always been that way. We've always done it that way. That's essentially a Romanist argument. But I think the greater threat is the charismatic and Pentecostal claim to continue to receive direct revelation from the Holy Spirit. After all, I mean, this is what the papacy claims. If you don't think this is dangerous, then you don't remember the Kansas City prophets where people's consciences were bound by claims of direct revelation. You have to sell me that 57 Chevy you just restored. The Holy Spirit told me, and you think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. I was there. It really happened. That's the same kind of binding, conscience binding, from which we were delivered 
in the in the uh, Reformation. Sola scriptura, sola scriptura matters for ministry because it means that no church, no lay person, nobody claiming a private revelation, no pastor, no assembly, no council can compel us to confess anything or do anything in public worship that God has not commanded. We are free people. We're free under the word of God. That matters for ministry. When we minister the word of God to people, we are setting captives free. We're giving them a charter of Christian liberty. People are entitled to their opinions about whether you should drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do. That, that's fine. But they don't have the, the authority to bind your conscience. You're free. And it's not a recommendation of chewing tobacco. I'm just... <laughs> I mean, if you want yellow teeth, but you're free to have yellow teeth. And, and you want to stain the side of your pickup, that's fine. You can do that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask Craig Troxell. He knows. <laughs> and finally, the Reformation saved the gospel. And that might be a funny sounding thing to say, and it is, but it's true. There's one message that distinguishes Christianity from all other entities, organizations, and religions on the earth. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? That God the Son became incarnate, was born of a virgin, obeyed the law on our behalf, was put to death for us, was raised for our justification, intercedes for us now as our only high priest, and is returning in glory to conquer all his enemies and bring us to uh, salvation. That is the good news. But for the Reformation, we almost lost it because in the medieval church, the West, uh, well, in the West, the medieval church had turned the, the gospel into a message not so much about what Christ had done for us, but about what is possible for those who do what lies within them or those who cooperate with grace. There were a couple of different competing messages. Neither one of them particularly good news. One's a little more gracious, one's a little more Pelagian. But this is particularly true for Luther, who was taught the Pelagianized version, that God helps those who help themselves. That's what he was taught in university. God helps those who help themselves. He was taught basically what Arminius later came to teach in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, that God had endowed all, uh, all humans universally such that if you capitalized on this endowment that God had given all, God is prepared to coact with that. Now, that's how Occam put it in the 14th century, but that's essentially what Arminius was saying in the 16th and 17th centuries, and that's what his followers were saying. Now, these sorts of formulations developed uh, for a reason. The church wanted people to be good, really wanted people to be sanctified, really wanted people to, to obey. The effect of what the church did was to put Christians back under what we would call the covenant of works, do this and live. And this is what people continue to do in our day. There are millions of Christians across the globe for whom the reformation of free acceptance with God on the basis, right, only of the righteousness of Christ, once for all imputed, received through faith, resting and receiving, not faithfulness, not fidelity, faith, resting and receiving, that is completely unknown. I remember teaching at a well-known evangelical college teaching a basic course in, a, in Christian doctrine and just explaining what Luther had discovered and said. And I remember uh, undergraduates coming up to me after class with tears streaming down their face and saying, I've never heard this before in my entire life. You know, they said that medieval church you just described, that was the church I grew up in. And it was such and such Bible Baptist church. It's true, I... It's true. I get correspondence all the time. People leave voicemail. People send me emails and DMs and texts, and they've never heard this message, ever. Why does the Reformation matter for ministry? Because it's the gospel. And it's the gospel that God uses to save his elect. I wish I, I had more time to go through more stuff, but there's nothing more central in the life of the church. And you say, well, 
Why do you say that? Well, because in the Belgian Confession, Article 29, we say there are three marks of the true church, and the first mark is the pure preaching of the gospel. Heidelberg 65, we say, since we're justified through faith, from where does this true faith come? And we say, the Holy Spirit works faith in our hearts, creates faith in our hearts, through what? The preaching of the Holy Gospel, and confirms it through the use of the Holy Sacraments. That's the thing that God, the Holy Spirit, has ordained to use, and that's the message that we have to get right. And it's not a complicated message. It's a counterintuitive message. It's a supernatural message, but it's not a complicated message. We just have to exercise faith and trust God to do what he said he would do and announce this improbable message that God the Son became incarnate and he obeyed in our place. He suffered in our place. He was was crucified for us, that our sins put him on the cross. But his righteousness brought him out of the tomb. And we have a high priest, a righteous high priest, whose righteousness is credited to us freely, whose sovereign Holy Spirit has given us new life and true faith. And through that, we've received all his benefits. We're united to him. We're adopted, to him, with, adopted by him. And he's our elder brother. And he's representing us now, and we're never more ever to come under condemnation. There are two stages of justification. There's just one. And Jesus accomplished it on the cross, and the Holy Spirit applies it once for all. This is not complicated stuff. Look, I'm a boy from Nebraska who, who grew up in the Omaha public school system. If I can understand this and articulate this, you can do it too, and you have to do it. Well, the Reformation does matter. There's anything more important than the preaching of the Word of God, the authority of the Word of God, and the gospel of Jesus Christ, the free acceptance once for all. And people are desperate for it. I wish you could see my inbox. All, probably now this morning, 750 emails in my inbox. They're desperate. And all you have to do is tell them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time this morning, and we pray that you'll give us boldness and courage and grace and joy and good cheer to go and announce these good tidings to everyone everywhere, and that you'll set the captives free, both in the church, laboring under bondage and slavery and darkness, and, and those outside the church who've never heard and who so desperately need to hear. Hear our prayer Make it so and make this Reformation Day not just a, a celebration for our team, but a, a, an opportunity to be renewed in our commitment to the gospel of free grace and free acceptance with God through Christ. Make it so, O Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's not beer and schnitzel, but it, it's donuts and juice. That will have to do.